Welcome to Breaking Down Bits, a conversation about great comedy bits with the comedians who wrote and performed them. Welcome to Breaking Down Bits. I'm Brian Gendron. Hey, I'm Drew Jordan. And man, this season three, this this podcast is growing. Kind of the, kind of the community of Breaking Down Bits is growing. Thanks for being a part of it. Maybe uh, you've hopped in and been a part of one of our uh, feedback mics on most Tuesday nights. It's That's been such a fun experience uh, connecting with uh, people all around the world and writing jokes and getting better and if you want to be a part of that, you can always shoot us an email, breakingdownbits at gmail.com. We try to do that most every single Tuesday at 9 p.m. Eastern. So we'd love to have you join in and be a part of that. Absolutely. So we do that Tuesdays at 9 p.m. Eastern. We run it tight. We run it about an hour. Breakingdownbits at gmail.com is send us a quick note. Say you want to get on the show next Tuesday. We'll try to get you on. Uh, also we've had a lot of great episodes. We just did a recording with Jenny Zagrino and, uh, what was one of your callbacks from the show, Drew? Gosh, so she dropped a lot of knowledge on us. I think the thing that resonated with me the most maybe was at the end of the episode, you really saw that she had a deep passion for some of the bits that she was writing and, and maybe on the backside of the, of the bit, she was kind of angry about a situation, but she turned it into comedy. And you, from the stage performance, you wouldn't know that she was like so passionate and kind of upset at what happened. Um, and so I just love that. Just being reminded to write about what you're honestly, truly passionate about. Find a way to turn that into material. And, and what she, she hates, uh, Gwyneth Paltrow. Excuse me. <laughs> that was, Excuse me. Dr. Was, Gwyneth Paltrow. <laughs> yeah. That was very obvious. Yes. Uh, my callback was we had a great segment or, or a part of the episode where she talked about videos submissions for uh comedy festivals so if yes. a lot of people have been talking about that online about hey comedy festivals are going to start coming back we got to start submitting so absolutely dive in and listen to that 10 minutes she was on the other side of those comedy festival submissions and so some great advice shared there by jenny so check out that episode yeah, that very smart yeah. Check out that episode. Check out all of our episodes. BreakingDownBits.com is where you can get to that, where you can get to everything Breaking Down Bits. Ready to ready to start the show, Drew? Well, we should give a quick reminder that, thankfully, uh, Brian and I have joined forces in another way other than just Breaking Down Bits. We have a local show here in Houston called The Riot, and you have a chance if you happen to be in town or coming through. Uh, we're getting the chance to book some of the Breaking Down Bits Um uh, interviewees and comics to come and actually perform. So Tom Takar, Sam Talent, both coming to Houston soon. You can get all those details uh, online, theriothtx.com. Yeah, theriothtx.com. Another exciting announcement. We've actually moved to a weekly format, and that's at Rudyard's in Houston. So if you're coming through, uh, submit us an email. Send it to thebreakingdownbits at gmail.com. Send us your tape. Let us know when you'll be in town, and we'll try to get you on. Absolutely. Let's get into it, man. Let's start the show and bring in our guest. Originally from Taiwan, Ed Hill is an award-winning comic who moved to Vancouver thinking he was on vacation at his father's discretion. He was voted Best Vancouver Comedian of 2015 and 2016 by Vancouver Courier Magazine. He's appeared on Gotham Comedy Live, Fox, TED Talks, and XM Radio's Laugh Attack. In 2021, Ed released a full one-hour special titled Candy and Smiley. The special is currently streaming on Amazon Prime and Apple TV. Welcome, Ed Hill. How are you, sir? Hey, guys. Hey, Drew. Hey, Jordan. Hey. I mean, hope Brian, I called you by your last name. I don't know why. Um, <laughs> I like our backgrounds. It's, uh, it's like a progression of hoarding. <laughs> yeah. yeah, what is going on back there? Are these I'm, like... I'm the, I'm the uh, full-blown disorder. That's what's going on right now. Are those video games or comics or what? They're all uh, manga comic books. Oh, okay. All right. Um, yeah, I, uh, I, I, ever, ever since I was a kid, I've been, you know, I know, I mean, even the movers when we're moving, they're like, hey, Eddie, you ever heard of the internet where you can just read this <laughs> online? But I, I've always collected them when I was a kid. So I think it's more of a sentimental thing. So I just keep buying them. <clears throat> and they're not easy to buy because like 
like the guy said, it's mostly on the internet now. So, yeah. yeah. Those, those yeah, aren't the sex ones, right? No, these are like just the mainstream ones, you know, like Naruto, um, oh. Dragon Ball, stuff like that. Yeah. Are they yeah, in alphabetical I, order? Look like they might be a little too organized. <laughs> um, I organize them by if the con series is still continuing. So everything you see behind me, if it's towards the front of the shelf, that means I'm adding to it. If it's in the back of the shelf, it means it's done. So I don't have to add to it. No way. It. Have you seen Brian Regan's latest special? Yeah. So, so he gets, yeah. yeah, yeah. He gets right into what exactly what you just said with his OCD <laughs> bit. Yeah. That's yeah, crazy. A little, little bit triggered when I watch that bit. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> little, I'm going to take a wild guess. Ed Hill uses a set list. He keeps, he has every set list he's ever done for the last 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> that I actually don't. That's interesting. Oh. Um, my writing process is completely different than this, so it's okay, kind of okay. like on the opposite spectrum. Interesting. Okay, we'll yeah. have to hop into that. We'll get into that in just a second. Um, we like to start off the episodes just talking about your progression of how you started. Uh, as uh, we have a lot of comics that are maybe just new to the game, maybe they just started doing comedy a couple years in. So we try to build this conversation to really. Um, I don't know, just impact maybe their their trajectory and where they're at as as a comedian. So tell us a little about your start. How'd you how'd you get into it? Maybe your big breaks, what got you to kind of where you are now? Um, well, I started actually taking a class. And I know it's a big taboo um, <laughs> for for most comics. You know, we we kind of make fun of the people who teach comedy. Um, we kind of make fun of people to teach anything, right? If you can't do, you teach a whole phrase, which is, is just so rude. Um, but that's, yeah, that's what I did. I mean, I was in, I was in grad school um, and I was, I was actually a DJ before all of this. So I was kind of, okay. you know, playing the nightclubs and that, that was when, you know, when the digital age started kicking in. So, um, you know, the records were going out, we're kind of moving into, you know, more just, you can just play MP3s on your computer. You can do do all the things you can do on the record at that point. So, you know, what ended up happening was I realized is well, I'll listen to the tracks I'm playing in the car and I'll listen to it in the club and I'll listen on the way home in the car. And I'm like, why am I doing that? I'm just an MP3 player at this point. <laughs> so I left. I was like, okay, I got to do some mouse, you know, with my life. I want to try something that's still, you know, Related to performance, and I saw a stand-up class was offered locally here, so I just kind of took it. And I was in the back of a coffee shop, you know, as comedy as it possibly can be. You know, it's kind of like somebody who's been teaching comedy for a while, and I did it. And and you know, I think this leads back to the whole organization piece. So <laughs> the whole point of the class was to come up with a five-minute set. I walk in with a five-minute set, and then it did two things. Number one, the teacher is like, "Why are you here?" Do you want a refund? Number two is everyone in the class was pissed off. They're like, why is this guy here? Like, did you bring this guy in to motivate us? Because this is really not helping. <laughs> so, yeah, so that's how I got started. And um, and I actually, I, I, I don't know if the, com I think, I don't know if the comedy clubs in Houston um, or the classes do this. At the end of the class, you kind of do a showcase of the local club. Um, so like a keener, I kind of went out and did open mics before I, did the 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 showcase mm -hmm. um so i kind of knew what it was like in reality because the showcase was nothing like because your friends and your family are all there right everyone's cheering you on and the reality is no one cares about you no one cares about you. <laughs> <laughs> that to yourself yeah so that's how i got started um big break um i don't know and i mean what do you what do you guys define big break as I mean, I just think of what, what took you to the next level, what got you to the place where you were, you know, thinking I should release a special, um, like, you know, new comics might dream right. about that, but you actually, you know, got to the place where you're, it's on Amazon, you're, you're there. What, how, where did you go from coffee shop five minutes to, um, to where you are now? Um, well, I think big break, I think a lot of, you know, people would look at big break as like, you know, a, a, a show they're on or like a, something they release for me personally actually the big break was i went on t i went on tour about three years in into my career and you know i went to boston i went to la and went to chicago and it was like a 15 show thing and i kind of lined up myself never left town before never went on the road and i bombed for 15 shows straight 
Oh. Yeah, every single show. I remember I was in hotel. I think it was in Boston. I I, I called my wife. It's like you know, I don't I don't think I can do this. She's like, oh no, you can do this. You just really suck right now. And yeah, <laughs> and and that's when I realized you know my material worked within like a three mile radius of Vancouver. If I travel anywhere out, no one knows what I'm talking about. So that was the moment where I threw out. I think at that point I had like you know 15, 20 minutes of you know good materials presentable and I was stretched to 30 that type of thing um so I kind of threw it all out I was like you know what none of the stuff is working I gotta go back to something that means something to me you know something that's gonna be universal doesn't matter where I am in the world and that's when I really started changing my material to talking about me and being personal and the things I experience in my life um, so I think for me, the, that's probably the big break because that really kind of changed everything. That was a catalyst to moving everything forward. And that's interesting because in the clip you play in the beginning um, of the intro for me, that first TV appearance, that was recorded right before I left town. And you can see the difference between that clip and everything else that follows because um, I threw all that stuff out. It was just it was not working anywhere else. What kind, of, what kind of material was it? Uh, what, what type of? It jokes? was very observational, um, racially focused um, stuff, and also it it picks up on a lot of local nuances on those racial observations, which is like you know, if you don't live in Vancouver, it makes no sense. Mm -hmm. So, you know, who who knows King Edward Street in? Vancouver other than people who live in Vancouver. And that my website is which is you know all my logins kingedhill.com. I'm not a king. I just thought it would be funny and this is another stupid mistake I made is you know oh mo you know there's a street called King Edward. So it'd be so funny if I put King Ed Hill because people all oh, like it's like the street and I realize <laughs> people in the world don't live in Vancouver. No, I just look like a pompous ass. So <laughs> but I already registered I, I already you know Logged in on everything, Twitter, all that stuff. I'm like, too late to change it now. I just keep it. I'll just it every time. So on the road, would you have? To, so I guess would you try to describe these things, and, and it just it, it took too much effort, right, for the audience to pick up with it, or did you just roll through your material like you were in Vancouver? I just rolled. I mean, I tried to tweak it um, about halfway through, you know, seven shows, and I'm like, okay, I think it's me. I don't think it's the. <laughs> <laughs> Every audience, uh, they suck. All of them. Yeah. It's just like, okay, I think it's me. Am I going to speak the right language at this point? Um, yeah, so, and I try to tweak it, but it was just, it was coming from a place that was so not, you know, true. So I think it didn't resonate. I mean, if I do get laughs, you know, it's kind of like the laughing at me rather than with me. And that, that I also didn't like. So true, yeah, yeah. I kind of threw everything out after I got home and just restarted. And it's you know it's tough to just throw mm -hmm. it out. So how many years um, did it take you to get to a place where you're kind of like I'm a headliner now? I got I can do what it, 30, 45 hour. Uh, how, what how, what point in your career did you kind of get to that place where you could do that? Um, comfortably, I would probably say because I'm about twelve years in. I was probably say nine or ten years in. I was comfortable. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I started heading, headlining some clubs about eight years in, and I was still not very comfortable. You know, there was, especially if you do a full hour, the last 10 minutes is definitely a battle. Um, yeah. You know, you can get 45 is kind of the sweet point, and then the last 15, you're just kind of like, okay, this is either going to go great, or I'm going to be doing a lot of crowd work to end the set. <laughs> Read my clothes, or hopefully they still remember who I am at that point. Um, so yeah, that I mean, but then you know, moving into I think, you know, ninth and tenth year, that's when it started getting. Then you, you start getting the flow because I again, you know, when you're doing sets around the city, maximum, you know, fifteen minutes you get unless you you know get a closing set of about 20, 30 minutes. You you never really get to run um, an hour or even forty five minutes. Um, so again, that's a whole whole new um, experience that I was even learning at that point. Yeah, are you still located in Vancouver? Um, I am. Yeah, I'm home now because COVID kind of brings everybody home. I'm usually on the road, but um, haven't haven't done anything for the last year like everybody else. 
Yeah. Well, that's cool. I, I love when we get to talk to guys who work the road because I feel like a lot of comics, you know, me and Brian, about two or three years in, you know, we, we come at this from a, a point of view that's like, Hey, we're newer comics. We're trying to pick up, trying to see what it's like. We're kind of doing our first, uh, our soul, our, our verse road gig sort of, um, together this weekend. Uh, and it's just exciting to like, you know, hit the road and, and do a couple shows and that kind of stuff. What's, oh, you, what's, guys op- you guys opened up, right? We're opening up for uh, Ian Lara. Um, but yeah, I, th- oh, I think he's saying we're open. No, yeah, we, yeah, yeah. Te- Texas is open. Like no, yeah. they're just like no masks. You, like, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we are That's open. Awesome. It's weird. Well, you guys, you guys got vaccines. Yeah. I mean, you guys are yeah. vaccinating people at, like at incredible speed. So it's amazing. Yeah. But we're in the city, so it's very liberal. Like it's there's still uh you still got to wear your mask. Like that's it's just you yeah. know for at least for now, but. Yeah. The ban is the ban has been lifted, but individual businesses all still require you to wear your mask. So, okay. and I mean, I'm still wearing my mask. I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to lose two weeks of my life. That's for sure. Well, I mean, uh, you know, at least you guys get to go on the road now. So, I mean, yeah, people, we get to do. I, I'm stuff. sure people will come out. I mean, people have been dying to watch shows. That's not <laughs> literally okay. That's not <laughs> oh. yeah, literally, yeah, yeah, yeah. literally, yes. So, what's uh, what's some of your uh, over the years? Like, what's some of the good road? road comic tips so how do you first start getting those road gigs what are some ideas that maybe these newer comics as they get they start to get 10 15 minutes 20 minutes of material and they're ready to start doing that what's some stuff we can be thinking about to take that next that next step um well i think you know there's a few ways to going about it so um festivals be a good way to go on the road um you know applying to festivals and because at a festival i did a lot of festivals in the beginning of my career mm-hmm. Um, you make a lot of connections. You know, it's kind of like a retreat for comics, mm. and you get to meet people from different places in the world, and you make those contacts. <clears throat> and a lot of these comics run shows. You know, like you guys, you guys run shows and stuff like that. So, you know, you you would be making these connections. Say, hey, if I come to your town, um, would you be able to set something up for me, and vice versa, the type of thing. So, like a collegial type of relationship. Um, another way is to, you know, if you know a headliner that comes into town, you get a chance to work with them, you know, you can always tag them on the road if they're willing to bring you along. Um, that's the way to do it. Um, that's definitely more difficult because, I mean, there's only so much space they got and, you know, they, they might already have somebody they work with. So that's going to be more difficult. Um, another way I found that was quite um, successful is, you know, you know, getting into clubs definitely takes time. And, but there's a lot of independent venues that host comedy nights. And I think the method is the same for me is just, again, that, that organizing books regimen, is, uh, <laughs> sending out emails, make sure you follow up and setting up a schedule. And so at one point, I think I was sending about 40 emails a day, just following up with people. Um, and I'm not emailing them every day, right? So it's like every two weeks, you know, every other week, if you know, they're more responsive. Um, so just sending out, you know, say, Hey, you know, any openings here, here's my availability or, you know, sending out new clips that you got say, Hey, it's a new bit of, you know, I, I just recorded, or this is a new show I, I was just on and would you like to watch it and stuff like that? You know, just that, you know, I think part of it is, you know, for bookers, they, they get a lot of, um, emails for sure. So just refreshing them and be memorable. I think that's probably key. Yeah, I think we're, you know, we're in a position now where we're booking a show and now we've, we've stepped up the frequency. Uh, and so we're starting to get some, so we're on the other side of that. And so I'm starting to see some of the stuff that's really good and some of the stuff that's just not so good. And you brought up a good point. Like, you know, sometimes you're like, all right, I sent my EPK. I sent everything that I put together. Like, now what? I can't just keep sending that. And the idea of sending a new clip that you just recorded is really smart. So always be recording, trying to get some fresh stuff in front of bookers. I think that's a really good idea. Well, it's a rule of three. For somebody to remember you, they got to see you three times. So either it's, you know, you're tweeting them or either it's you're emailing them or you see them in person. Um, by the third time, they'll kind of remember you. Also, you know, the more they see you, the more they, they're familiar with you, the more chances they're going to like you. So um, this is why I realized that just, just by having FaceTime alone, um, the liking goes up. So that's just one thing I found that's been helpful. And, the, you know, even, somebody could know you well, but the less they see you and the less they expose to you, the less they're going to like you. And that's 
just a weird thing that happens. So that's why I realized, you know, keeping in touch. Sometimes you may, I mean, myself, I feel like I'm a pest. Like, oh God, you know, mm -hmm. it's getting an email from me. But sometimes they don't read it. They just see your name on the thing and they just kind of delete it. That in itself, you know, it's still they, hey, at email. So maybe I'll read the next one he sends or something like that. Yeah. Well, yeah. networking, networking really is such a key to comedy because, I mean, we know, or I, we've, I've learned just personally, just in our city, it's the other comics right now that generally put you on shows. And so if you've got good relationships with your local scene, then you get more bookings. And if you are a recluse, and you don't interact with people and you never, you know, make those connections, then you don't get booked as much. And mm -hmm. I'm terrible at networking. Brian is like born to network. Um, and so it's, it's a struggle for me to like, you know, do that. Cause I'm just I'm, in person. I feel like I get awkward. I'm just like, Hey, so, Hey, <laughs> and I got nothing to say. I don't know. Um, so if you're good at networking or if you can level up your networking skills, sounds like, with a little perseverance and some, uh, some scheduled emails and stuff, you can really make some, make some moves. Yeah. I think if you're just, you know, I think all human beings, like people who are kind and sincere. So if you're just kind and genuine, sincere people, you know, there's always going to pe be people who don't like you. That's just, just a fact of life. Not everyone's going to like you. So, but if you're just kind of sincere and genuine, I think, you know, you're going to be quite successful. That's, you know, yeah. you don't have to be an ass just to yeah. get, yeah, if, if if you if they don't like you and you and you show up sincere and genuine, they're wrong. <laughs> they're, they're they're in the wrong. You can take comfort in that. Yeah. Or it could just be that they're being sincere and genuine because they're just generally angry all the time. So yeah, <laughs> they're sincerely angry. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. Yeah. Uh, tell me, I'm I'm fascinated by by TED Talks. Tell us about that. Uh, yeah. Um. Yeah, I got uh, <laughs> invited by. I think it's. Um. I don't even remember how they found me but I, I got an email saying hey would you like to do a talk um i think it's for i think it's for youth i, I think that's what the i don't you know i don't research things before i get into them like this show <laughs> i read five minutes before hopping on and i usually don't even read it so i just get on halfway through like oh this is what's about um <laughs> so i didn't really know what was happening i was like okay fine i'll just do a show and then i showed up um and you know, everyone there is like, you know, Olympic athlete, professor. Mm -hmm. And then they're like, I'm gonna put you halfway because you're you're you gotta be more entertaining. So kind of just right before intermission. I was like, okay, cool. Um, they're not gonna learn anything, so whatever. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I get on and they they're like, Okay, you have um, I think you have 10, 10 or 12 minutes. Like Ted Talks is pretty strict on their time. So, and then they say, Well, can I can I get a light? Cause you know, I, I don't, there's nothing to gauge as what's going on. They're like, okay, I will light you from the side with a, like a cell phone light. I'm like, okay, cool. So my wife is in attendance. She's, you know, she's kind of, you know, cause parking in that part of town, it's downtown Vancouver is really tricky. So she kind of dropped me off and she came in after. And so I go on and, you know, and I really felt like, you know, I think I'm running the light. <laughs> and so, but I'm like, I don't see anything. So obviously it's fine. And people are having fun, you know, they're laughing. I was like, okay, I'll just keep going. And at one point, I just see a panicked coordinator on the side going, waving her arms. I was like, okay, well, what is that? <laughs> and then, <laughs> then I see my wife moving towards the middle of the, like, the whole auditorium, just waving the flashlight like this. <laughs> I was like, okay, I'm going to wrap up. I wrap up and I'm supposed to, I think I'm supposed to do 10 or 12. I did 25 minutes. Ah. <laughs> yeah. I walked out and they were so angry. They were like, Ed, we told you 10 minutes. How come you didn't, you know, get off? We, we've been flashing you. I'm like, I can't see anything. Your lights are so bright in the auditorium. You know, you're flashing the corner of my eye. I can't see anything. I didn't see it until you were panicking. Um, <laughs> you're supposed to stay till the end and kind of, you know, socialize. And I just kind of left. I was like, I'm not. <laughs> No one likes me right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, the audience likes you. No one who works for Ted, Ted yeah. Talk is ever going to invite you back for anything. <laughs> and it's 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 funny because it's right before intermission, right? So everyone's out in the lobby getting their drinks and stuff like that. So I was walking through, and all audience members were like, "Oh, that was great, very entertaining." You know, it's just so nice to have a change. You know, not being lectured. And then you know, as people are talking to me, you can see the coordinator in the back. You know, just giving the death stare. I'm like, "Oh yeah, I'm, I'm gonna get out of here." Yeah, thank you guys for coming out. <laughs> <laughs>
Oh man, that's good. Yeah. And then, um, and you probably saw the shirt I was wearing. Um, I also didn't prepare to dress more formally. So I just kind of grabbed the only shirt I have available that wasn't wrinkled. So and that, that I've never worn that shirt ever again. That's the only time I won that shirt. And now it's, I donated it. So, <laughs> so it didn't you fit. think about that set again. Yeah, it looks super weird. I look like a lumberjack um, who just <laughs> lost his home. So... <laughs> So you like to do a lot of trial and error type stuff with your with your life. <laughs> just, I'm gonna go on the road and just uh, book all these shows and just bomb. Yeah, it let's and see I'm, what happens. Let's just yeah. uh, let's disorganize the books and see what, what happens. Do it, but it, man, it's good though. And that's how you learn. You know, if it's one way. I'm kind of and honestly, I'm the same way. I'm just gonna. I'll go up and I'll do. I'll try new things and and fail and and get you know fail forward. Right, get stronger. Yeah, I mean it's 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 just fun. That's that's the way I look at it, you know. And my biggest goal, I think, is just have fun. And you know, it could be a huge show, it'd be a you know small show in a bar. If it's not fun, why? Why do it? I mean, you only get to live once, so why put yourself through something you don't want to do? So that's that's the way I look at it. You know, this is fun. Let's let's go through it. If I make mistakes or what, at least I had a good time. Yeah, you picked a cool career. I mean, this this is a fun, you know, we talked about the business side of it a little bit, but like when you're actually on stage and there's audiences and you're doing well, that's fun. And yeah. it's one of the best jobs in the world. And you get to meet, you know, all kinds of people. So it's incredible. Absolutely. Well, we can uh, maybe make the transition and talk a little bit about uh, writing. When th- sure. we loved it, we'd love to hear about your strategy uh, and, and we kind of just do it in an open-ended format. So take it where you want. How does Ed Hill write comedy? I don't write anything down. That's one thing. If you look in my notes, I mean, I put in my phone, you'll see um, everything is either one word or two or three words per line. And those those are the bits um, or the joke. So the way I write is I, you know, I, I go I go in. So I go, you know, rather than observing what's outside of me, I go inside as to, hey, what am I scared of? What am I worried about? Um, what are some things that really mean something to me? Or, you know, some things that I'm terrified of sharing with people. Um, then that's the stuff I will actually talk about. Um, wow. Yeah. So, I mean, it's tough. Sometimes I'm like, do I really want to talk about this? Because then when you pull out from that pain, um, the humor just comes naturally. Because everything that's painful has some sort of irony to it. Right. Yeah. Because, you know, suffering never just comes logically. It always comes from illogical places. Um, so that's that's how I do it. And then, you know, what I'll do is then maybe attach it to something that I'm observing, either, you know, in the world or in my life, that type of thing. So kind of build a theme around it. Um, so, you know, in the special, like in the very beginning, you saw, you know, the very beginning of the theme is different is difficult. And it's trying to and then I'm trying to build using these jokes to mm-hmm. capture the idea that different is difficult. And, you know, and this is something that actually my wife taught me. It's not a comic that taught me or a mentor that taught me. Um, my wife hates comedy. So I marry somebody who hates what I do. <laughs> She's not a comedy fan. If we just, if we ever watch anything, she'll watch either romantic stuff or dramatic stuff. She never picks comedy. She likes to cry. So that's what she likes. <laughs> um, so every time I come up with something, um, and this is definitely earlier, um, she still does it now, is she'll ask me, so what does that, what does that mean to you? You know, why are you saying that? And, you know, it, it really pisses me off. I'm not going to lie. It's like, what do you mean? It's funny. Like, come on. Like, who, who cares what it means to me? But then I'll try it, and I realize it doesn't work as well as I thought it would. And I'll come back. I'm like, damn it, she's right again. And I think what she's coming from is because she's not coming from a comics perspective. She's coming from an audience perspective. So she's looking at you saying this, like, why are you telling me this? Why would I laugh at that? Because I don't even know why you're saying it. So then I really have to take it. And that's how I really work my stuff is what does it mean to me? How does it resonate with me? And then tell that joke. And then that's when I realized that started resonating with people because now I'm tapping into experience that we all have because what I've experienced, most likely any of us have gone through, like we all gone through, you know, breakups, losses, you know, prejudice, stuff like that. So, um, and that's my process, you know, and I, 
you know, that's more of the general way of me writing. Um, and the more systematic way of, um, I do in it, so this comes to more technical stuff, is I really watch the words I, I use. So, um, you know, I'll work, I'll, if you, I don't, I don't know if you, you would notice, I, I will often use words that has syllables that's more, um, probably more abrupt. So like sounds like t or k or more throw sounds in the punchline because sure. that creates more humor for some reason, right? Yeah. So there's a reason why, you know, the F word is funny because it has all those components. Um, and if I'm, trying to, if I'm trying to relay information or set up a premise, I'll use softer sounds. Oh. So that's what I've been tweaking with a lot. Um, just using the sounds and also, you know, the economy of words, of course, trying to say something the most simple way. Yeah. There was that Simpsons joke where Krusty has a sore throat from using all the K words in his punchlines. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Too much cacophony. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. That's really good. I, I know I've heard of people who like to use the cacophony and obviously in the punchline, but I never thought about the softer words for information. Mm. That's a, that's a nice, other side of the coin reference there. And I love the idea of thinking, what am I embarrassed or vulnerable uh, to share? And let's find a way to share it. Like that's challenging and I love it. Yeah. And you know, the first punchline usually is not the best punchline. That's why I noticed too, because, you know, naturally you try to protect yourself, right? So mm. you don't really say what you want to say. So then the, what I really do is, okay, that's not bad. Hello, what are the punchline can I get from this? And you know, that's you know, that's that's definitely the work. I mean, I'm, for me, I'm still working on that. It's just trying to not to fall in love with my first punchline, and we all do, right? And it's like oh, that's good enough. You know, I'm a genius, right? That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. But then you end up writing the same joke as like twenty five hundred other comedians. And it, yeah. it's not it's not personal or interesting enough. And then it's like, oh well, that's anyone can tell that joke. I need something that don't that's something that I can tell that's personal to me. Yeah. And my my buddy Monroe Martin um in New York, you know, he told me one thing is like you don't have to be the funniest guy in the room. Um, you just gotta be the most memorable and the most interesting. So because people remember interesting, people don't remember funny. So oh. the don't you hate that at the end of a showcase when people are walking out and they remember everybody else and they're just like, Oh yeah, you were good too. You're like, oh, I did not accomplish what I meant, what I meant, what I set out to do. And it's to be memorable and, or interesting and obviously funny, but you want to be the one that they say you want, they come up to not the guy next to him. And I've, I've been on both sides of that and uh, Oh, it doesn't feel good to be. <laughs> well, the worst, the worst part is people coming up to me saying, Hey, um, if they, there's another Asian guy on stage. They'll come up and say, hey, great set. And I was like, well, that's the other guy. So <laughs> well, that I, was love that. I love that joke you did about the, oh, that's not my joke. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> happens all the time. And, you know, but now I think it's a little different when I go more personal um, is people come and say, hey, my dad was like that. My mom was like that. So, you know, there's that, you know, that piece where people can glom onto now. It's like, hey, that's who he is. Um, that's different than everybody else. Love that's it. that's the human experience that you get to. I love that that build up. Just w start with, from within, go then go to observational. So many people want to lead with Jerry Seinfeld, lead with observational. But you start within, go to, and then you talk about the human experience, and that's where you make the connection. Uh, just kind of brilliant writing uh, technique, and then just softer setup, harder punches. Uh, I'm taking all this stuff with me to my next writing session. So thanks for sharing. Yeah, and part of me is like, you know, if you can do Seinfeld, that's amazing. I can't. That's just not who I am. I can't just, I can't detach myself from the things I talk about. You know, I try. I mean, that's that's partially why, you know, I don't go into acting because I don't know how to be anybody else. I just, it's, it's just me. So if you want to see me in every single role, just being me, then yeah, sure, cast me or else. I don't mean, come me. on, Adam Sandler, like he, he's the same character in every, like a lot yeah. of comics, a lot of comics do that yeah. and they're, and they're great actors. They just play their, their selves kind of in every single movie. Yeah. So when I, it comes to, oh, sorry. When it comes oh, to like sorry. sets and stuff, how do you prepare for a, a set? That's another question we get into. Say you got a big set coming up. Are you making a set list in your head? Are you writing anything down? What do you do pre to prepare for a show? Um, usually what I'll do is I'll create something that has a beginning to an end. So it kind of, it comes to a complete circle 
Um, I really I like the idea of a circle that, you know, what you say in the beginning um, kind of, it's almost like a story. You know, it doesn't have to be a story, but it could be a flow of a story. So there's there's this the beginning. And so in itself, the set is a giant setup punch. Um, but within it, there's all these setup punches. And of course, you know, the biggest punch is in the end. Um, and everything that is in the beginning are seeds you're planting to get to this punch in the end. Um, so that's the way I like to set up my stuff. Um, and, you know, I just I just like that reaction in the end. Everyone, oh, that's why that joke in the beginning was there. Because, you know, the, the seeds you plant, so that, you know, in the beginning, you know, about a minute and two minutes in, the punch, of course, won't be as strong because you're planting seeds. But when it comes back again, either it's a callback or, you know, it's a parallel structure type of thing. Um, it's definitely going to end stronger and it's more memorable that way. So that's the way I, I, I like to frame my sets. I don't just like to go in through and just tell jokes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, part of it is also it's, it's kind of fun to challenge myself to see how do I how do I take this five minutes or seven minutes or 10 minutes and make it into a theme that captures what I'm trying to say. Yeah, that's super interesting and got to be difficult. But to, to create an arc, basically yeah. a story arc inside your comedy set. I, that's such a good idea and but such a tough got to be tough to execute yeah because you know especially if you're testing a material um you know at you know smaller shows or open mics because you always want to do new stuff right so um sometimes i just wanted to well can i just do five bits of new stuff with disjointedness um i've done that before but I, what i realized is in the end well how do i fit it into this grand scheme of things it's gonna, it's gonna be a problem later on, anyways. I'm just avoiding the problem in the beginning for myself. So the challenge is again, it's like, okay, how do I slide this new three minutes into something that I maybe I can sandwich it between um, to create a create a greater theme? And you know, for the special especially, you know, what I was able to do. So if you watch the special, there's very specific big segments that I built that I can move around, um, and you know kind of piece together as this overflowing arc. And that's, you know, that's the way I've been structuring my stuff um, for a very long time. Um, I wish I could just do one-liner jokes or observational stuff, but it's just, it doesn't work. Um, it's just not, it's not who I am. King Edward Street, right? <laughs> oh God. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you, what are you doing right before you get on stage? Do you have any rituals or anything that, that you need to do to get into the right space before you step on? Um, before, uh, before any shows, I mean, if you ask any comics in the green room, I'm usually looking at memes or <laughs> playing a game on my phone. Um, yeah, that's, that's what I do. I usually don't, I mean, by that point, my, 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 my thing is if I, you know, it should be something that I want to say and naturally, you know, willing to say. So if I'm still sitting there studying it before I go on stage like as a test. It's probably not going to do well. So um, usually if I, by the minute I get in the green room, I already know what's going to happen. So, you know, I, I go, I continue living as I, I would, you know, back on the phone and look at all the useless stuff that you don't need to know. <laughs> Perfect. I like that. Yeah, let, let your mind rest before you, before you get out and, and put it to work. Uh, yeah. Let's, uh, let's set up the, the special. So this is such a incredible concept that you, it's Candy and Smiley. Of course, that's the name of your parents. They're chosen names. Uh, and uh, tell us about that. I mean, it's, it's so unique the way that you delivered this. I, I, I imagine this was influenced by the idea that we're in the pandemic. I don't, or perhaps it was, this, it was set up this way the whole time. But tell us about uh, how you did this. Yeah, originally it was definitely not going to look like this. There was okay. no, I didn't think so. <laughs> no intention. For it to be, I mean, no comic will wish to do it this way. Um, so it's supposed to be, I mean, like a theater and, you know, the audience coming. But two weeks prior to the actual taping, everything locked down. I mean, at that point, um, the production team and my management were all kind of sitting together going, what do we do? Like, do we proceed? Do we just stop? Like, we're so close. And, you know, we actually decided to keep going. So we're like, you know what? Let's catch, let's catch the wave, which is like the worst analogy we can use. Let's catch the wave, just get it done, then we're fine, right? Um, but the health authorities made the decisions for us two weeks before they just shut everything down. And I, I really, to be honest, I think in the back of our head, even though the risk wasn't high health-wise, 
I think, you know, that fear is irritating in people's heads. So people are like, you know what, even if it's safe, I'm not going to come because I don't want to take the risk. So, because even I felt that, right? I'm like, even I'm, I'm doing the show. I don't even really want to go. <laughs> so, so that kind of like just knocked everything off the table. And so we're kind of like, okay, so like everybody else, we kind of say, hey, let's do it in October. Um, you know, pandemic would be over by October, right? It's just <laughs> because right. that's true. Um, <laughs> and so, and then I think it was June and beginning of July, we're like, I don't think it's gonna be over because it's getting worse. So then there's, so basically is do we give up, forget it, wait till the whole thing is over and then shoot it or do we regroup? So I kind of, you know, so the highs, the highs, the lows, the lows for me, I kind of went back to the drawing board, you know, and I went, why don't I just do it in like a circle, like an AA group with the people I know. And it was daunting, it was terrifying um, because two things, number one, these people know me. They all know my, they've been to my shows, they know my materials, each of them know different parts of the story um, and the reality behind it. So there's that terrifying part. Um, and second of all is I haven't been on stage for like, you know, four months. I've done like one show and, and that's an online show, which we know doesn't do much. Um, so, and then I've, I've been, I've been touring nonstop, like every week for about a good year and a half to get this together and just went to a halt. Um, so there was the decision to you know, let's just do it this way. And, you know, we pitched it back to the distributor. They say, yeah, that's fine. Go ahead. And, you, just, you know, and I also had to make the very, very um, difficult decision. Do I end on a laugh or do I end on not a laugh? And I decided on and not ending on a laugh because we already started somewhere that's different. We can't end somewhere that's the same. So, um, yeah. And so you get to see all the people that's in my life and, you know, and the, uh, you get to see my parents um, at the end, who this is the first show they ever came to. They never came to a show ever before. Oh, wow. Yeah. And yeah. you named the special after them. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, you know, this idea that you know, I think my my whole life I've been trying to figure out who I am, right, as a first generation immigrant. And you continue to try to figure out this identity. And really, can you um, differentiate who you are by just cutting everything else, everyone out of your life? I don't think so. So for me, who I am is who we are. Um, you know, all the people in my life kind of contributed to who I am. So that's why the special is titled towards them. And also it's kind of my my true intention personally is to like a tribute to them. Just a little thank you for everything they've done coming to this country, giving up everything they've given up. And, you know, as a, as a son and as a comedian, can you really give back? I mean, not really. So this is as much as I can do. Just a small <laughs> thank you to them. Yeah. Awesome. Wonderful. Uh, I'm going to go ahead. We've got a couple separate clips. We normally play one long clip. We're going to play a few clips from the special uh, in no particular order. I'm going to play this one. I was never allowed to have friends over for a sleepover. Yeah, because my dad thinks they all steal. Yeah, but I was allowed to go sleep at my friend's house because my dad also believes I'm a thief. <laughs> so I'm gonna bring things home and make it all better. Yeah. And, you know, I, uh, I never had allowance. I, I hear people talk about allowances and stuff like that. And I gotta say, it's never a thing for me. Um, this is how it works in the house. I'll tell you this is how it works. If we want something, we ask for it. And whatever my dad buys, it's guaranteed to be fake. Yeah. When I was 14, I asked my dad for Ninja Turtles on my Nintendo, and he got me Ninja Frogs. <laughs> I don't even know how that's possible. It wasn't until I was 21 I realized DVD came in boxes. Because <laughs> yeah. all my DVD were in bags, it's always fake. Right? There's always one of those that, like, you know, someone's sitting in the middle of a theater with a camcorder. And it's like shaking the whole time. Every 20 minutes, some guy would stand up, walk and run in front of it. I'd be like, Dad, what is that? He's like, oh, that's 3D. I'm like, I don't think that's how it works. Oh, my God. <laughs> that's so good. I can see, now that you mentioned it, I can see how you build it up, right? You're, you're in this sort of intimate space, this relatable allowance stuff we all kind of went through as kids. 
And then you just punched it up to that point where it's, it's just hilarious. It's so funny. Yeah. You totally yeah. see the soft delivery of the information and you hide the punchlines very well because it sounds like you're just, it sounds like we're just sitting on, especially since the setting is such, it sounds like we're just sitting around talking to you, hearing about your childhood and, and whatever. And then all of a sudden it's like, bam, there's this like little unexpected punchline that kind of comes out of nowhere because your, your delivery style is so relaxed uh, mm -hmm. on this special. And you know, the truth is behind those bits is tremendous amount of pain. You know, I cried for weeks when I got Ninja Frogs. I'm like, <laughs> I don't want Ninja Frogs. This game sucks. <laughs> and then, you know, the DVDs and stuff like that, you know, you never get a chance to watch the actual movies. I mean, those are those things are not watchable. The, the fake, you know, the can't like it's just you don't watch the movie. You're just watching people watching the movie. <laughs> and then uh, you know, the sleepover, I've never had a sleepover in my life. Like that's never happened in my life. And I don't know what's it like, you know, I don't know, <laughs> you know, it's something I never experienced. And, you know, so that's, you know, behind it is just so much pain. It's just like, you know what, that's actually something I lost. But I think, you know, we all had that experience of, you know, not being able to do something in our lives. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I definitely connect with that deeply because a lot of my act is I grew up, my dad's a Baptist preacher, very conservative town. And, and my life was vastly different growing up as a preacher's kid versus all my other friends. And so my experience in life was a little unique and I, I try to pull from that and it was tough and it's caused, you know, as you get, as you become an adult, you do look back on those experiences and go, Oh, that was, that was kind of messed up. <laughs> that was tough. Yeah. And you gotta, you gotta relive a little bit to find the humor in it. So love it. Yeah. yeah. And then the, the observational piece, we all remember, or we, we all know of these knockoff type things. We've had experiences with them. So that's where you layered in the observational thing that as relatable universally uh, to bring, to really bring home this and, and tie this together from personal to observational to, to punch. It's great. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and fire up one more. I'm trying to do these in a, in a smart order. Here's one more. When I was 14, my dad signed me up for uh, Boy Scouts just to show me how much he hates me. <laughs> <laughs> and Boy Scouts, I, I learned, is all about badges. You know, you got to do things and get badges. The more badges you have, the better are you as a scout. So I remember before my first meeting, I went online, found the store that saw the badges, went in there, bought it all, went in the first meeting with a full sash. <laughs> yeah, I look at the South American dictator. <laughs> <laughs> I was standing, I remember I was in the meeting, I was standing there, um, and one of the guys been there for years, right? He was so impressed, because I just, I just showed up. He's looking at me, he's like, oh my God, Ed, oh my God, what does it take to get all these badges? I'm like, $29.95. <laughs> it's, it's very simple. And you know, every, um, every summer I have to go to summer camp. Um, you know, I gotta go stay there at the cabin. I don't know if you guys remember summer camp, you know? And every time I go, I have to lie. That's what I have to do, lie. Because when you're stuck in a cabin, a bunch of 15, 16 year old boys, all they want to talk about is your first sexual experience. And I can never tell the truth. Because I don't think any of you know this. But the first time half of me, I was touching myself. I finished, it was over the ground. My mom has to walk in, slip on it, fell, broke her hips, and went to the hospital. Yeah, I can't tell my friends that. What am I gonna say? They'd be like, Ed, so what happened during the first time? I'm like, uh, I destroyed my mom's ass. I, like, I can't say that, it's disgusting. Oh my God, such a personal story. <laughs> Yeah, so that bit, there was a lot of, do I talk about this or do I not talk about this? Wow. And just, I mean, just thinking back, I mean, it's so cringe, right? It's like, oh, my God, I can't believe. And I, I think I was like, you know, 13, 14 or something like that when it happened. And yeah, <laughs> yeah but, you know, and I was like, but it's just, it's so funny. Like, if you think about it, how ridiculous <laughs> the whole thing was, like, for this to happen. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're living by your mantra there of like exposing the most vulnerable uh, things that just open you up to like just ridicule and you're finding a way to own it and yeah. heal through it. I, I, and I, I, I would imagine not to like to derail from the comedy conversation, but I would imagine that had to be incredibly healing to release that stuff, to work through it, to process it, 
and you must feel more mental health sort of because you're able to just let it go. You're not holding back any weird things. It's just out there. Yeah, I think that's maybe why I'm so chill most of the time. Because, I mean, all this stuff, I mean, if you think about it, if you push it down, <clears throat> all you're going to get is anger out of it, right? You're, like, angry about why it happened, how it happened, how can I make it so it never <laughs> happened. Um, I mean, even the, the Boy Scout thing, it may seem um, mundane, but I felt so bad because I, I literally went to – like they made me captain a boy scout and i was like i didn't do any of this shit i, didn't do any of I never went camping i never made a knife i never done any of this stuff i'm captain and i'm leading this pack of you know people who's been in boy scouts for years looking up to me you know ask me what i do and i didn't know what to do like we went i remember our first camping trip you know all i did was i hung one of the guys underwear on top of the tent because i thought it'd be fun and they're like, can you do anything else? I'm like, I don't know what to do. Like, sorry, all those badges, I just bought it. I don't know. <laughs> I have no skills. <laughs> well, hey, it's like buying it's like buying a black belt and going to your first day at Taekwondo. I'm like, what's up? What's up, guys? <laughs> I know, we're all gonna die. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I went through the Boy Scout experience, and I, I think I recall it's so long ago, but I think you literally do like you earn the badge, but you still go and buy the badge yourself. So you could just buy them. It's just, that's yeah. accessible. And if you don't understand the culture of Boy Scouts, which I, I still don't, I was in it. Uh, or, you know, if you're from another culture, that, you're just like, Oh yeah, I'll just buy them all. That's, that, that's, this is part of the uniform. <laughs> I, I had a badge that says I speak French. I don't even <laughs> speak. Well, like I, it was so ridiculous. Like we, we would have to do apple days. I didn't remember apple days to sell apples in front of grocery stores to do, um, you know, for charity and, you know, get money. And people come up to me and speak French. I'm like, I don't, I don't know what you're saying. And they're like, well, you speak French. I'm like, oh, uh, yeah, yeah. The batch speaks French. I don't. I don't. <laughs> That's so good. Uh, I've got, I've got one more. I don't even know if I could take it at you're, you're killing me, man. This is, this is really funny stuff. All right. This is the last one. The world is not a friendly place. It's not always rainbows and sunshine. Right. I remember I was, I think I was 17. I, I, I told my dad, I want to be a musician. I was so scared. I was sitting, you know, right in front of him on the kitchen table. And I told him I want to be a musician. And I thought he was going to punish me. Because a lot of parents don't like that. Some of you here are parents. You know, because it's not a secure job. I get it. It's, there's no benefits, you know, no retirement. He didn't. He didn't punish me. He took me to a toy store. He said, I can pick up whatever I want. Anything I want. So I remember when I went in the back. I grabbed the biggest Lego set i ever seen in my life. The pirate ship. I took it to the counter. My dad followed me. I put it down. And he didn't do anything. <laughs> He didn't take out his wallet. He didn't make eye contact with the clerk. He did nothing. I was like, Dad, I, uh, I don't have any money. He said, like, congratulations, you are now a musician. <laughs> yeah. So now I'm a comedian, so screw him. <laughs> Let's just keep downgrading and see how low we can go. <laughs> I, I said one for last just for the comics out there That's <laughs> making, so their, good. making their parents proud That's i still so remember good. that conversation with him it's, it was it was horrible you know he was just he was not happy you can tell that's a and, tough uh, immigrant dad love right there i know and then uh but I, I think the whole point of the bid was you gotta do what your heart tells you to do man like you know i want to be a musician like i told you guys i was a dj and you know do all that stuff i think part of me just I like the, you know, the idea of being able to express yourself. So, um, you know, you can't, you can't be not who you are. I think that's, that's what I'm trying to say in that bit. You know, you, your parents can try to inform you and push you around type of thing, but you're always going to go back to where you are. And, you know, ironically, my dad was a poet. He wrote a shit ton of poems and I read them and they were great. And um, so I asked him why, you know, he went in, you know, he didn't, he didn't go into poetry and he, you know, he's, he's actually a, you know, physician before he retired. And he's just like, well, cause your grandma thinks poems don't make any money. I was uh. like, okay, cool, nice. So you're just going to continue the abuse as that was happening? <laughs> are, are you going to break the cycle with you have kids and break the cycle of this abuse? Um, well, you know, whatever my kid wants to do, you know, he or she can do it. 
That's that's my philosophy. You know, I'm not gonna pay for it, but you can do whatever you want. Hey, you know? <laughs> there it is. That, that's a that's a tough day at the toy store. I tell you that right now. <laughs> what was the toy? Do you remember? Uh, it was Lego. It was Lego. Uh, I always wanted the Lego. So, um, and then he bought the Lego later on. He bought a castle, which is just like okay. I I don't want the castle. It was just such a weird construction worker, maybe. Yeah, it was such a such a weird like he's trying to reward you for being, you know, good, and then it's it's something you don't want. It's just like okay, why don't you just? I don't understand. I don't. <laughs> I it, was, it wasn't like a logo or something. <laughs> no, I don't think they existed back then. There's no uh, fake Legos. <laughs> I think Legos like was popular enough to be faked at that point. They got so. the copyright locked down on that stuff. Yeah, I mean this this whole dynamic with my dad still happened the taping because at the end when they were filming them coming in for some reason my mom and dad can't line up their pacing so they just kept walking different speeds and we're just like okay you guys have been married for 40 years you can't walk next to each other hold hands for god's well, you sake just, you destroyed her hip years ago and it never quite <laughs> she, got, she never could get back to walking at a her regular mom's walking pace great. she's walking great <laughs> so and then finally they paced themselves they got to the point right the x where they're supposed to stand and the director goes, cut. I'm like, okay, now what? So the director comes in and goes, Smiley, can you please just look at least a little bit proud of your son? And my dad just went, okay, I don't know how to do that. Like, I can oh. speed, but like looking for, I don't know what that means. I was just like, let's just do the take. Whatever it looks like, it looks like. That's it. That's the end of it. That's, oh my goodness. Yeah. That's so funny. I mean, yeah, but it's so relatable. Like, even hearing just hearing your story, so many things are firing in my head, and I'm sure the audience members are all feeling that um, because we all kind of live, no matter how different our stories are. I think there's always uh, there's similarities kind of that we all live through that are tough and relationship with your parents and embarrassing stuff in your teen years, like so relatable. And the fact that you're taking the that wide end of the funnel stuff we all know. And then taking it down to that personal uh, other side of the funnel. It's just perfect. Love it so much. Thank you. Let, let's go ahead and move into our last segment, Ed, if you're ready for it. Uh, I have a quick graphic. Bear with us. So this is called Last Laugh. And uh, sorry. <laughs> and so what we do is we ask you, Ed, this is your comedy legacy. So uh, what you want to be known for it could be your joke, somebody else's joke, but what do you want to have written on your tombstone? What joke? Um, are you <laughs> to read your hand up? <laughs> I know what it should be, but you, I want to hear yours first. <laughs> it's, it's actually not going to be um, anything that's you know you heard in the special. This is actually a joke I've been telling for a long time. I didn't put it in special because it just doesn't fit. It's uh, I got 99 problems and diarrhea is all of them. That's what <laughs> Perfect. That is a wonderful uh, tombstone right there. I love it. And you know what? It's, I, I refuse to. I mean, that's another sore point is uh, my wife thinks I have IBS. And I'm like, I don't think I do. But she's like, well, it's not food poisoning because there's no way every food you eat is a poison. So I don't know. Yeah. yeah. I've, got, I've got Crohn's disease. I've got poop jokes. Um, go get yeah. yourself checked out. Go see a GI. Let them do all the poking and prodding. You'll you'll thank yourself for it later down the road because I, I went through that. It's terrible. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Good. That's how we end comedy podcasts with doctor recommendations and <laughs> colonoscopy requests. Um, yeah, I thought for sure your tombstone was going to be like, "Sorry, I destroyed my mom's ass" or something. <laughs> that was the. Uh, no, it's still got to be about me. I'm not going to talk about my parents. <laughs> Are you kidding? <laughs> That's right. Well, well, listen, Candy and Smiley uh, is available on Apple. It's on uh, Amazon Prime, all the, all the places. Uh, so please go out and check that out. See more of that material. It's so good, Ed. Uh, what else? What else can we know? Where else can people find you? Social media, all that fun stuff. Um, well, you can probably um, look out for my dad's pirate version of my special. <laughs> Try to pirate off Amazon for no reason. Like I have a copy, Dad. I can just send it to you. That's so funny. <laughs> I don't even want to see what it looks like. It's probably so bad. It's probably got no audio or whatever it is. <laughs> um, but all my logins are uh, kingedhill.com, um, you know, King Ed Hill, Instagram, Twitter. Um, my podcast called Son of Smiley, which I do every week. It's just a little bit of 
audio diary I do of a childhood story um, that I record, either it's with my, myself or you know something that happened between me and my parents, my brother, and my cousins. Um, I mean, I think it's four years in the running. Initially, I just kind of started as a diary, so I don't remember. I don't. I don't forget these stories. So I remember them, and people have been glom on listening to them. So you can also find me there. Son of Smiley Podcast. What? Well, I, I, honestly, this has been so much fun, and uh, and your process is wonderful. So a, a lot of takeaways for me personally, and I'm sure for our guests. Get out there and listen to Son of Smiley. Go 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 watch uh, Candy and Smiley, and and follow Comedy Royalty king ed hill <laughs> on social media <laughs> yeah. Th thanks for listening everybody thanks for joining ed thanks ryan uh, thanks for take care thanks for listening to breaking down bits you can keep in touch or get more when you follow at breaking down bits on social media visit the website breakingdownbits.com or shoot us an email at breakingdownbits at gmail.com.